going to drop the ball, Nadine. Be looking at something and completely miss the time. I'm so sorry, guys. I'm like so a little bit today. Apparently, where did I put my hairbrush? You know where I put my hairbrush? I'm like I didn't even get my hairbrush. <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> oh my gosh. And look at it, look at the disaster my, my, my table's in and all that kind of fun stuff. And what do you do? What do you do? Oh, so I didn't even change the title. Oh, oh. One of those days. Um, yeah, I like dropped the ball on that one for sure. Um, but that's okay. We're here, we're live now and and um so i said 39 to and apparently last week i forgot to change it altogether save but hey what do you do okay pop out my jet hi honey okay have fun with the birdies have fun with the birdies. Mwah. And um, I know I'm sorry I hung up on you quick. <laughs> I like, I like. Oh no, I gotta go, Josiah. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh well, it's just it, it just happens. <laughs> You'll survive, honey. We'll have a quick. We'll have a quick hello later. <laughs> hey, Johnny, how you doing? Haven't seen you for a while. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm glad you could make it. I'm a little disorganized. But hey, that's kind of that's the way it happens. Oh, that's awesome. I'm glad. I'm glad you're you're doing good. So, um today we're gonna be Oh keep me from sitting funny first. It's always weird sitting funny. And um I'm just gonna go and share that. Um and get my, uh, get it all shared out. Um, uh, why can't I think of what I'm doing? Oh my gosh. My brain is like, doo 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 Like, I tweet. And, and retweeted, retweeted out. I was looking at uh, armchairs. Okay. Bye, darling. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I was looking. I was looking at chairs. For um, I discovered that there's actually chairs for sitting on the floor. I didn't know there was. So I, uh, since I'm where I'm sitting, it's um, almost like that. I'd like to actually have a chair to sit in. But of course, where I'm sitting, I can't have a chair. So I was looking at, uh, I was going to build myself using an old chair, but most old chairs, it's the back that's broke, not the legs. But there's apparently these adjustable ones, and I was looking at those. I'm thinking about getting one of those. Maybe I'll throw that in my wish list. And it's like a uh, foldable floor chair. It's called a gaming sofa chair. I don't know why it would be gaming, but, um, whatever. My, my, uh, thoughts about it is, I wonder what the, um, 
if the back is any good. Like, how's the back? Uh, easy to... Oh, it's like a yoga chair. That's... That's, um... Interesting. I'd have to have a look. I'm going to have to have a look at that because it seems to be something that I would like to get. Yeah, the Johnny, I, I'll show you here. Just uh, give me a second. Let's see. Uh, we will go face to chat. Then there's the chat. Hands, face, frame, headset. No. Okay, fine. Uh, display capture. Okay. Okay. Um. Uh. Transform. Fit to screen. There we go. So. This is what I was talking about. One of these thingies. Uh, this is in Walmart, US. I can't get stuff from there, but it's uh, one of these kind of things. It's like a yoga chair -y thing. This one's cheaper than the other one I was looking at. I was looking at uh, this one. It's a nice bit of a cushion, but I'd want to sit more up. I don't know if it lets you sit up like the other one would. And this one here, too, I was looking at. Because uh, that's the kind of thing I was looking at. So it would be more like a Japanese kind of, or Chinese, I'm not sure. Japanese, I think, sit on the floor. But yeah, that's the kind of thing. So does that make any sense? <laughs> Japanese, yeah. Um, well, right now I'm sitting on a bed. <laughs> With a pile of pillows behind me. <laughs> and I'd rather, like, I'd rather be sitting on a chair like that on my bed because <laughs> then I think I'd have better back support problem is is if I sit at my desk my um, I find it hurts my legs too much but I can sit cross-legged uh, for a long time and it not hurt my back but I can't sit for very long in a regular chair before my back really really hurts so, so there's that. Yay, fun. What do you do? Anyway, so I'm going to, I'm going to start up the books. And, and that kind of works because the books is the Japanese ancient tales and folk, folklore. I did it again. I did that last week. Folklore. Folklore of Japan. <laughs> I'm having one of those days. Okay. Mute myself and play. Chapter 39 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith The Blind Beauty Nearly 300 years ago, or, according to my storyteller, in the second year of Kawani, which would be 1626, the period of Kawani having begun in 1624 and ended in 1644, there lived at 
maidazuru in the province of tango a youth named kichijiro kichijiro had been born at the village of tai where his father had been a native but on the death of the father he had come with his elder brother kichisuke to maidazuro the brother was his only living relation except an uncle and had taken care of him for four years educating him from the age of eleven until fifteen and kichijiro was very grateful and determined that now he had reached the age of fifteen he must no longer be a drag on his brother but must begin to make a way in the world for himself after looking about for some weeks kichijiro found employment with shiwaya hachiyimon a merchant in maizuru he worked very hard and soon gained his master's friendship indeed hachiyimon thought very highly of his apprentice he favored him in many ways over older clerks and finally entrusted him with the key of his safes which contained documents and much money now hachiyimon had a daughter of kichijiro's age of great beauty and promise and she felt desperately in love with kichijiro who himself was at first unaware of this the girl's name was ima o ima san and she was one of those delightfully ruddy happy-faced girls whom only japan can produce a mixture of yellow and red with hair and eyebrows as black as a raven ima paid kichijiro compliments now and then but he was a boy who thought little of love he intended to get on in the world and marriage was a thing which had not yet entered into his mind after kichijiro had been some six months in the employment of hachiyimon he stood higher than ever in the master's estimation but the other clerks did not like him they were jealous one was specially so this was kanshichi who hated him not only because he was favored by the merchant but also because he himself loved oima who had given him many a rebuff when he had attempted to make love to her so great did this secret hate become at last kanshichi vowed that he would be revenged upon kichijiro and if necessary upon his master hachiyimon and his daughter oima as well for he was a wicked and scheming man one day an opportunity occurred kichijiro had so far secured confidence that the master had sent him off to kasumi in tajima province there to negotiate the purchase of a junk while he was away kan sichi broke into the room where the safe was kept and took therefrom two bags containing money in gold up to the value of two hundred ryo he effaced all signs of his action and went quietly back to his work two or three days later kichijiro returned having successfully accomplished his mission and after reporting this to the master set to his routine work again on examining the safe he found that the two hundred ryo of gold were missing and he having reported this the office and the household were thrown into a state of excitement after some hours of hunting for the money it was found in a koro incense burner which belonged to kichijiro and no one was more surprised than he it was kanshichi who had found it 
naturally after having put it there himself he did not accuse kichijiro of having stolen the money his plans were more deeply laid the money having been found there he knew that kichijiro himself would have to say something of course kichijiro said he was absolutely innocent and that when he had left for kasumi the money was safe he had seen it just before leaving hachiyemon was sorely distressed he believed in the innocence of kichijiro but how was he to prove it seeing that his master did not believe kichijiro guilty kan shichi decided that he must do something which would render it more or less impossible for hachiyemon to do otherwise than to send his hated rival kichijiro away he went to the master and said sir i as your head clerk must tell you that though perhaps kichijiro is innocent things seem to prove that he is not for how could the money have got into his koro if he is not punished the theft will reflect on all of us clerks your faithful servants and i myself should have to leave your service for all the others would do so and you would be unable to carry on your business therefore i venture to tell you sir that it would be advisable in your own interest to send poor kichijiro for whose misfortune i deeply grieve away hachimon saw the force of this argument and agreed he sent for kichijiro to whom he said kichijiro deeply as i regret it i am obliged to send you away i do not believe in your guilt but i know that if i do not send you away all my clerks will leave me and i shall be ruined to show you that i believe in your innocence i will tell you that my daughter ima loves you and that if you are willing and after you can prove your innocence nothing would give me greater pleasure than to have you back as my son-in-law go now try and think how you can prove your innocence my best wishes go with you kichijiro was very sad now that he had to go he found that he should more than miss the companionship of the sweet o ima with tears in his eyes he vowed to the father that he would come back prove his innocence and marry o ima and with o ima herself he had his first love seen they vowed that neither should rest until the scheming thief had been discovered and they were both reunited in such a way that nothing could part them kichijiro went back to his brother kichisuke at tai village to consult as to what it would be best for him to do to re-establish his reputation after a few weeks he was employed through his brother's interest and that of his only surviving uncle in kyoto there he worked hard and faithfully for four long years bringing much credit to his firm and earning much admiration from his uncle who made him heir to considerable landed property and gave him a share in his own business kichijiro found himself at the age of twenty quite a rich man in the meantime calamity had come on pretty o ima after kichijiro had left madazuru kan si chi began to pester her with attentions she would have none of him she would not even speak to him and so exasperated did he become at last that he used to waylay her on one occasion he resorted to violence and tried to carry her away by force 
of this she complained to her father who promptly dismissed him from his service this made villain kan shichi angrier than ever as the japanese proverb says kawasia amati nikusa ya hayakubai which means excessive love is hatred so it was with kan si chi his love turned to hatred he thought how he could be avenged on hachimon and oima the most simple means he thought would be to burn down their house the business offices and the stores of merchandise that must bring ruin so one night kan shi chi set about doing these things and accomplished them most successfully with the exception that he himself was caught in the act and sentenced to a heavy punishment that was the only satisfaction which was got by hachimon who was all but ruined he sent away all his clerks and retired from business for he was too old to begin again with just enough to keep life and body together hachimon and his pretty daughter lived in a little cheap cottage on the banks of the river where it was hachimon's only pleasure to fish for carp and jacko for three years he did this and then fell ill and died poor oima was left to herself as lovely as ever but mournful the few friends she had tried to prevail on her to marry somebody anybody they said sooner than live alone but to this advice the girl would not listen it is better to live miserably alone she said than to marry one for whom you do not care i can love none but kijiro though i shall not see him again oima spoke the truth on that occasion without knowing it for true as it is that it never rains but it pours oima was to have more trouble an eye sickness came to her and in less than two months after her father's death the poor girl was blind with no one to attend to her once but an old nurse who was stuck to her through all her troubles ima had barely sufficient money to pay for rice it was just at this time that kichijiro's success was assured his uncle had given him a half interest in the business and made a will in which he left him his whole property kichijiro decided to go and report himself to his old master at madaziro and to claim the hand of oima his daughter having learned the sad story of downfall and ruin and also of ima's blindness kichijiro went to the girl's cottage poor oima came out and flung herself into his arms weeping bitterly and crying kichijiro my beloved this is indeed almost the hardest blow of all the loss of my sight was as nothing before but now that you have come back i cannot see you and how i long to do so you can but little imagine it is indeed the saddest blow of all you cannot now marry me kichijiro petted her and said dearest ima you must not be too hasty in your thoughts i have never ceased thinking of you indeed i have grown to love you desperately i have property now in kyoto but should you prefer to do so we will live here in this cottage i am ready to do anything you wish it is my desire to re-establish your father's old business for the good of your family but first and before even this we will be married and never part again 
we will do that to-morrow then we will go together to kyoto and see my uncle and ask for his advice he is always good and kind and you will like him he is sure to like you next day they started on their journey to kyoto and kichijiro saw his brother and his uncle neither of whom had any objection to kichijiro's bride on account of her blindness indeed the uncle was so much pleased at his nephew's fidelity that he gave him half of his capital there and then kichijiro built a new house and offices in madaziro just where his first master hachimon's place had been he re-established the business completely calling his firm the second shiwoa hachimon as is often done in japan which adds much to the confusion of europeans who study japanese art for pupils often take the names of their clever masters calling themselves the second or even the third or the fourth in the garden of their madzero home was an artificial mountain and on this kichijiro had erected a tombstone or memorial dedicated to hachimon his father-in-law at the foot of the mountain he erected a memorial to can chi thus he rewarded the evil wickedness of can shi chi by kindness but showed at the same time that evil doers cannot expect high places it is to be hoped that the spirits of the two dead men become reconciled they say in madziru that the memorial tombs still stand end of chapter 39 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter 40 of ancient tales and folklore of japan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org ancient tales and folklore of japan by richard gordon smith the secret of idamachi pond in the first year of bunkyu eighteen sixty one to eighteen sixty four there lived a man called yehara keisuke in kasumigaseki in the district of kojimachi he was a hatamoto that is a feudatory vassal of the shogun and a man to whom some respect was due but apart from that yehara was much liked for his kindness of heart and general fairness in dealing with people in idamachi lived another hatamoto hayashi hayato he had been married to yehara's sister for five years they were exceedingly happy their daughter four years old now was the delight of their hearts their cottage was rather dilapidated but it was hayashi's own with the pond in front of it and two farms the whole property comprising some two hundred acres of which nearly half was under cultivation thus hayashi was able to live without working much in the summer he fished for carp in the winter he wrote much and was considered a bit of a poet at the time of this story hayashi having planted his rice and sweet potatoes sato imo had but little to do and spent most of his time with his wife fishing in his ponds one of which contained large suppon terrapin turtles as well as koi carp suddenly things went wrong yehara was surprised one morning to receive a visit from his sister okome i have come dear brother she said to beg you to help me to obtain a divorce or separation from my husband divorce why should you want a divorce have you not always said you were happy with your husband my dear friend hayashi for what sudden reason do you ask for a divorce 
remember you have been married for five years now and that is sufficient to prove that your life has been happy and that hayashi has treated you well at first o kome would not give any reason why she wished to be separated from her husband but at last she said brother think not that hayashi has been unkind he is all that can be called kind and we deeply love each other but as you know hayashi's family have owned the land the farms on one of which latter we live for some three hundred years nothing would induce him to change his place of abode and i should never have wished him to do so until some twelve days ago what has happened within these twelve wonderful days asked yehara dear brother i can stand it no longer was his sister's answer up to twelve days ago all went well but then a terrible thing happened it was very dark and warm and i was sitting outside our house looking at the clouds passing over the moon and talking to my daughter suddenly there appeared as if walking on the lilies of the pond a white figure oh so white so wet and so miserable to look at it appeared to rise from the pond and float in the air and then approached me slowly until it was within ten feet as it came my child cried why mother there comes o sumi do you know o sumi i answered her that i did not i think but in truth i was so frightened i hardly know what i said the figure was horrible to look at it was that of a girl of eighteen or nineteen years with hair dishevelled and hanging loose over white and wet shoulders help me help me cried the figure and i was so frightened that i covered my eyes and screamed for my husband who was inside he came out and found me in a dead faint with my child by my side also in a state of terror hayashi had seen nothing he carried us both in shut the doors and told me i must have been dreaming perhaps he sarcastically added you saw the kappa which is said to dwell in the pond but which none of my family have seen for over one hundred years that is all my husband said on the subject next night however when in bed my child seized me suddenly crying in terror-stricken tones o oh, sumi here is o oh, sumi how horrible she looks mother mother do you see her i did see her she stood dripping wet within three feet of my bed the whiteness and the wetness and the dishevelled hair being what gave her the awful look which she bore help me help me cried the figure and then disappeared after that i could not sleep nor could i get my child to do so on every night until now the ghost has come o oh, sumi as my child calls her i should kill myself if i had to remain longer in that house which has become a terror to myself and my child my husband does not see the ghost and only laughs at me and that is why i see no way out of the difficulty but a separation yehara told his sister that on the following day he would call on hayashi and sent his sister back to her husband that night next day when yehara called hayashi after hearing what the visitor had to say answered it is very strange i was born in this house over twenty years ago but i have never seen the ghost which my wife refers to and have never heard about it not the slightest allusion to it was ever made by my father or mother i will make inquiries of all my neighbours and servants and ascertain if they ever heard of the ghost or even of any one coming to a sudden and untimely end there must be something it is impossible that my little child should know the name sumi she never having known any one bearing it inquiries were made but nothing could be learned from the servants or from the neighbours hayashi reasoned that the ghost being always wet the mystery might be solved by drying up the pond perhaps to find the remains of some murdered person whose bones required decent burial and prayers said over them the pond was old and deep 
covered with water plants and had never been emptied within his memory it was said to contain a kappa mythical beast half turtle half man in any case there were many terrapin turtle the capture of which would well repay the cost of the emptying the bank of the pond was cut and next day there remained only a pool in the deepest part hayashi decided to clear even this and dig into the mud below at this moment the grandmother of hayashi arrived an old woman of some eighty years and said you need go no farther i can tell you all about the ghost osumi does not rest and it is quite true that her ghost appears i am very sorry about it now in my old age for it is my fault the sin is mine listen and i will tell you all everyone stood astonished at these words feeling that some secret was about to be revealed the old woman continued when hayashi hayato your grandfather was alive we had a beautiful servant girl seventeen years of age called o sumi your grandfather became enamoured of this girl and she of him i was about thirty at that time and was jealous for my better looks had passed away one day when your grandfather was out i took sumi to the pond and gave her a severe beating during the struggle she fell into the water and got entangled in the weeds and there i left her fully believing the water to be shallow and that she could get out she did not succeed and was drowned your grandfather found her dead on his return in those days the police were not very particular with their inquiries the girl was buried but nothing was said to me and the matter soon blew over fourteen days ago was the fiftieth anniversary of this tragedy perhaps that is the reason of sumi's ghost appearing for appear she must or your child could not have known of her name it must be as your child says and that the first time she appeared sumi communicated her name the old woman was shaking with fear and advised them all to say prayers at osumi's tomb this was done and the ghost has been seen no more hayashi said though i am a samurai and have read many books i never believed in ghosts but now i do End of chapter 40. Recording by Rob Marland. Chapter 41 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith The Spirit of Yanoki Footnote Fuja Sei said that this was an old story told him by his nurse who was a native of the village of okiyama also that a solid gold buddha eighteen inches in height had been stolen from the temple three years ago End footnote. there is a mountain in the province of idsumi called okiyama or ojiyama it is connected with the mumaru yama mountains i will not vouch that i am accurate in spelling either suffice it to say that the story was told to me by fukuga sei and translated by mr ando the japanese translator of our consulate at kobe both of these give the mountain's name as okiyama and say that on the top of it from time immemorial there has been a shrine dedicated to fudo mayo achala in sanskrit which means immovable 
and is the god always represented as surrounded by fire and sitting uncomplainingly on as an example to others and he carries a sword in one hand and a rope in the other as a warning that punishment awaits those who are unable to overcome with honor the painful struggles of life well at the top of okiyama high or big mountain is this very old temple to fudo and many are the pilgrimages which are made there annually the mountain itself is covered with forest and there are some remarkable cryptomerias camphor and pine trees many years ago in the days of which i speak there were only a few priests living up at this temple among them was a middle-aged man half priest half caretaker called yenoki for twenty years had yenoki lived at the temple yet during that time he had never cast his eyes on the figure of fudo over which he was partly set to guard it was kept shut in a shrine and never seen by any one but the head priest one day yenoki's curiosity got the better of him early in the morning the door of the shrine was not quite closed yenoki looked in but saw nothing on turning to the light again he found that he had lost the use of the eye that had looked he was stone blind in the right eye feeling that the divine punishment served him well and that the gods must be angry he set about purifying himself and fasted for one hundred days yenoki was mistaken in his way of devotion and repentance and did not pacify the gods on the contrary they turned him into a tengu long-nosed devil who dwells in mountains and is the great teacher of jujitsu but yenoki continued to call himself a priest ichigan hoshi meaning the one-eyed priest for a year and then died and it is said that his spirit passed into an enormous cryptomeria tree on the east side of the mountain after that when sailors passed the chinu sea osaka bay if there was a storm they used to pray to the one-eyed priest for help and if a light was seen on the top of okiyama they had a sure sign that no matter how rough the sea their ship would not be lost it may be said in fact that after death of the one-eyed priest more importance was attached to his spirit and to the tree into which it had taken refuge than to the temple itself the tree was called the lodging of the one-eyed priest and no one dared approach it not even the woodcutters who were familiar with the mountains it was a source of awe and an object of reverence at the foot of okiyama was a lonely village separated from others by fully two ri five miles and there were only one hundred and thirty houses in it every year the villages used to celebrate the bon by engaging after it was over in the dance called bon odori like most other things in japan the bon and the bon odori were in extreme contrast the bon was a ceremony arranged for the spirits of the dead who were supposed to return to earth for three days annually to visit their family shrines something like our all saints day and in any case quite a serious religious performance the bon odori is a dance which varies considerably in different provinces it is confined mostly to villages for one cannot count the pretty geisha dances in kyoto 
which are practically copies of it it is a dance of boys and girls one may say and continues nearly all night on the village green for the three or four nights that it lasts opportunities for flirtations of the most violent kind are plentiful there are no chaperones so to speak and to put it vulgarly every one goes on the bust hitherto virtuous maidens spend the night out as impromptu sweethearts and in the village of which this story is told not only is it they who let themselves go but even young brides also so it came to pass that the village at the foot of okiyama mountain away so far from other villages was a bad one morally there was no restriction to what a girl might do or what she might not do during the nights of the bon odori things went from bad to worse until at the time of which i write anarchy reigned during the festive days at last it came to pass that after a particularly festive bon on a beautiful moonlit night in august the well-beloved and charming daughter of kurahashi yoza imon okimi aged eighteen years who had promised her lover kurosuke that she would meet him secretly that evening was on her way to do so after passing the last house in her mountain village she came to a thick copse and standing at the edge of it was a man whom o kimi at first took to be her lover on approaching she found that it was not kurosuke but a very handsome youth of twenty-three years he did not speak to her in fact he kept a little away if she advanced he receded so handsome was the youth o kimi felt that she loved him oh no my heart beats for him said she after all why should i not give up kurosuke he is not good-looking like this man whom i love already before i have even spoken to him i hate kurosuke now that i see this man as she said this she saw the figure smiling and beckoning and being a wicked girl loose in her morals she followed him and was seen no more her family were much exercised in their minds a week passed and o kimi san did not return a few days later tame the sixteen-year-old daughter of kinsaku who was secretly in love with the son of the village headman was awaiting him in the temple grounds standing the while by the stone figure of jizodu sanskrit shitigarbaha patron of women and children suddenly there stood near tamai a handsome youth of twenty-three years as in the case of o kimi she was greatly struck by the youth's beauty so much so that when he took her by the hand and led her off she made no effort to resist and she also disappeared and thus it was that nine girls of amorous nature disappeared from this small village everywhere for thirty miles around people talked and wondered and said unkind things in okiyama village itself the elder people said yes it must be that our children's immodesty since the bon odori has angered yenoki san perhaps it is he himself who appears in the form of this handsome youth and carries off our daughters nearly all agreed in a few days that they owed their losses to the spirit of yenoki tree 
and as soon as this notion had taken root the whole of the villagers locked and barred themselves in their houses both day and night their farms became neglected wood was not being cut in the mountain business was at a standstill the rumor of this state of affairs spread and the lord of kishiwada becoming uneasy summoned sonobi hayama the most celebrated swordsman in that part of japan sonobi you are the bravest man i know of and the best fighter it is for you to go and inspect the tree where lodges of the spirit of yenoki you must use your own discretion i cannot advise as to what it is best that you should do i leave it to you to dispose of the mystery and the disappearances of the nine girls my lord said sonobi my life is at your lordship's call i shall either clear the mystery or die after this interview with his master sonobi went home he put himself through a course of cleansing he fasted and bathed for a week and then repaired to okiyama this was in the month of october when to me things always looked their best sonobi ascended the mountain and went first to the temple which he reached at three o'clock in the afternoon after a hard climb here he said prayers before the god fudo for fully half an hour then he set out to cross the short valley which led up to the okiyama mountain and to the tree which held the spirit of the one-eyed priest yenoki it was a long and steep climb with no paths for the mountain was avoided as much as possible by even the most adventurous of woodcutters none of whom ever dreamed of going up as far as the yenoki tree sonobi was in good training and a bold warrior the woods were dense there was a chilling damp which came from the spray of a high waterfall the solitude was intense and once or twice sonobi put his hand on the hilt of his sword thinking that he heard someone following in the gloom but there was no one and by five o'clock sonobi had reached the tree and addressed it thus o honourable and aged tree that has braved centuries of storm thou hast become the home of yenoki's spirit in truth there is much honour in having so stately a lodging and therefore he cannot have been so bad a man i have come from the lord of kishiwada to upbraid him however and to ask what means it that yenoki's spirit should appear as a handsome youth for the purpose of robbing poor people of their daughters this must not continue else you as the lodging of yenoki's spirit will be cut down so that it may escape to another part of the country at that moment a warm wind blew on the face of sonobi and dark clouds appeared overhead rendering the forest dark rain began to fall and the rumblings of earthquake were heard suddenly the figure of an old priest appeared in ghostly form wrinkled and thin transparent and clammy nerve shattering but sonobi had no fear you have been sent by the lord of kishiwada said the ghost i admire your courage for coming so cowardly and sinful are most men they fear to come near where my spirit has taken refuge i can assure you that i do no evil to the good so bad had morals become in the village 
it was time to give a lesson the villagers customs defied the gods it is true that i hoping to improve these people and make them godly assumed the form of a youth and carried away nine of the worst of them they are quite well they deeply regret their sins and will reform their village every day i have given them lectures you will find them on the mini toge or second summit of this mountain tied to trees go there and release them and afterwards tell the lord of kishiwada what the spirit of yenoki the one-eyed priest has done and that it is always ready to help him to improve his people farewell no sooner had the last word been spoken than the spirit vanished sonobi who felt somewhat dazed by what the spirit had said started off nevertheless to the mino toge and there sure enough were the nine girls tied each to a tree as the spirit had said he cut their bonds gave them a lecture took them back to the village and reported to the lord of kishiwada since then the people have feared more than ever the spirit of the one-eyed priest they have become completely reformed an example to the surrounding villages the nine houses or families whose daughters behaved so badly contribute annually the rice eaten by the priests of fudo mayo temple it is spoken of as the nine family rice of oki end of chapter 41 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Chapter 42 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by richard gordon smith the spirit of the lotus lily for some time i have been hunting for a tale about the lotus lily my friend fugua has at last found one which is said to date back some two hundred years it applies to a castle that was then situated in what was known as kenai now incorporated into what may be known as the kyoto district probably it refers to one of the castles in that neighborhood though i myself know of only one which is now called nijo castle fukuga who does not speak english and my interpreter made it very difficult for me to say that the story does not really belong to a castle in the province of izumi for after starting it in kyoto they suddenly brought me to izumi making the hero of it the lord of koriyama in any case i was the first told that disease and sickness broke out in kenai kyoto thousands of people died of it it spread to izumi where the feudal lord of koriyama lived and attacked him also doctors were called from all parts but it was no use the disease spread and to the dismay of all not only the lord of koriyama but also his wife and child were stricken there was a panic terror in the country 
not that the people feared for themselves but because they were in dread that they might lose their lord and his wife and child the lord koriyama was much beloved people flocked to the castle they camped round its high walls and in its empty moats which were dry there having been no war for some time one day during the illness of the great family tada samon the highest official in the castle next to the lord koriyama himself was sitting in his room thinking what was best to be done on the various questions that were awaiting the daimo's recovery while he was thus engaged a servant announced that there was a visitor at the outer gate who requested an interview saying that he thought he could cure the three sufferers tada samon would see the caller whom the servant shortly after fetched the visitor turned out to be a yama bushi mountain recluse in appearance and on entering the room bowed low to samon saying sir it is an evil business this illness of our lord and master and it has been brought about by an evil spirit who has entered the castle because you have put up no defence against impure and evil spirits this castle is the centre of administration for the whole of the surrounding country and it was unwise to allow it to remain unfortified against impure and evil spirits the saints of old footnote rakan and footnote have always told us to plant the lotus lily not only in the one inner ditch surrounding a castle but also in both ditches or in as many as there be and moreover to plant them all around the ditches surely sir you know that the lotus being the most emblematic flower in our religion must be the most pure and sacred for this reason it drives away uncleanliness which cannot cross it be assured sir that if your lord had not neglected the northern ditches of his castle but had kept them filled with water clean and had planted the sacred lotus no such evil spirit would have come as the present sent by heaven to warn him if i am allowed to do so i shall enter the castle to-day and pray that the evil spirit of sickness leave and i ask that i may be allowed to plant lotuses in the northern moats thus only can the lord of koriyama and his family be saved Salmon nodded in answer for he now remembered that the northern moats had neither lotus nor water and that this was partly his fault a matter of economy in connection with the estates he interviewed his master who was more sick than ever he called all the court officials it was decided that the yamabushi should have his way he was told to carry out his ideas as he thought best there was plenty of money and there were hundreds of hands ready to help him everything to save the master the yamabushi washed his body and prayed that the evil spirit of sickness should leave the castle subsequently he superintended the cleansing and repairing of the northern moats directing the people to fill them with water and plant lotuses then he disappeared mysteriously vanished almost before the men's eyes wonderingly but with more energy than ever the men worked to carry out the orders 
in less than twenty-four hours the moats had been cleaned repaired filled and planted as was to be expected the lord koriyama his wife and son became rapidly better in a week all were able to be up and in a fortnight they were as well as ever they had been thanksgivings were held and there were great rejoicings all over izumi later people flocked to see the splendidly capped moats of lotuses and the villagers went so far as to rename among themselves the castle calling it the lotus castle some years passed before anything strange happened the lord koriyama had died from natural causes and had been succeeded by his son who had neglected the lotus roots a young samurai was passing along one of the moats this was at the end of august when the flowers of the lotus are strong and high the samurai suddenly saw two beautiful boys about six or seven years of age playing at the edge of the moat boys said he it is not safe to play so near an edge of the moat come along with me he was about to take them by the hand and lead them off to a safer place when they sprang into the air a little way smiling at him the while and fell into the water where they disappeared with a great splash that covered him with spray so astonished was the samurai he hardly knew what to think for they did not reappear he made sure they must be two kappas mythical animals and with this idea in his mind he ran to the castle and gave information the high officials held a meeting and arranged to have the moats dragged and cleaned they felt that this should have been done when the young lord had succeeded his father the moats were dragged accordingly from end to end but no kappa was found they came to the conclusion that the samurai had been indulging in fancies and he was chaffed in consequence some few weeks later another samurai murata ippi was returning in the evening from visiting his sweetheart and his road led along the outer moat the lotus blossoms were luxuriant and ippi sauntered slowly on admiring them and thinking of his lady love when suddenly he espied a dozen or more of the beautiful little boys playing near the water's edge they had no clothing on and were splashing one another with water ah reflected the samurai these surely are the kappas of which we were told before having taken the form of human beings they think to deceive me a samurai is not frightened by such as they and they will find it difficult to escape the keen edge of my sword ippai cast off his clogs and drawing his sword proceeded stealthily to approach the supposed kappas he approached until he was within some twenty yards then he remained hidden behind a bush and stood for a minute to observe the children continued their play they seemed to be perfectly natural children except that they were all extremely beautiful and from them was wafted a peculiar scent almost powerful but sweet and resembling that of the lotus lily ippai was puzzled and was almost inclined to sheathe his sword on seeing how innocent and unsuspecting the children looked but he thought that he would not be acting up to the determination of a samurai if he changed his mind 
gripping his sword with renewed vigour therefore he dashed out from his hiding place and slashed right and left among the supposed kappas ippi was convinced that he had done much slaughter for he had felt his sword strike over and over again and had heard the dull thuds of things falling but when he looked about to see what he had killed there arose a peculiar vapour of all colours which almost blinded him by its brilliance it fell in a watery spray all around him ippai determined to wait until the morning for he could not as a samurai leave such an adventure unfinished nor indeed would he have liked to recount it to his friends until he had seen the thing clean through it was a long and dreary wait but ippai was equal to it and never closed his eyes during the night when morning dawned he found nothing but the stalks of lotus lilies sticking up out of the water in his vicinity but my sword struck more than lotus stalks thought he if i have not killed the keppas which i saw myself in human form they must have been the spirits of the lotus what terrible sins have i committed it was by the spirits of the lotus that our lord of koriyama and his family were saved from death alas what have i done i a samurai whose every drop of blood belongs to his master i have drawn my sword on my master's most faithful friends i must appease the spirits by disemboweling myself ippai said a prayer and then sitting on a stone by the side of the fallen lotus flowers did harakiri the flowers continued to bloom but after this no more lotus spirits were seen End of chapter 42 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 43 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c ancient tales and folklore of japan by richard gordon smith the temple of awabi in noto province there is a small fishing village called nanano it is at the extreme northern end of the mainland there is nothing opposite until one reaches either korea or the siberian coast except the small rocky islands which are everywhere in japan surrounding as it were by an outer fringe the land proper of japan itself nano contains not more than five hundred souls many years ago the place was devastated by an earthquake and a terrific storm which between them destroyed nearly the whole village and killed half of the people on the morning after this terrible visitation it was seen that the geographical situation had changed opposite nano some two miles from the land had arisen a rocky island about a mile in circumference the sea was muddy and yellow the people surviving were so overcome and awed that none ventured into a boat for nearly a month afterwards indeed most of the boats had been destroyed being japanese they took things philosophically every one helped some other and within a month the village looked much as it had looked before smaller 
and less populated perhaps but managing itself unassisted by the outside world indeed all the neighboring villages had suffered much in the same way and after the manner of ants had put things right again the fishermen of nano arranged that their first fishing expedition should be taken together two days before the bon they would first go and inspect the new island and then continue out to sea for a few miles to find if there were still as many thai fish on their favorite ground as there used to be it would be a day of intense interest and the villages of some fifty miles of coast had all decided to make their ventures simultaneously each village trying its own grounds of course but all starting at the same time with a view of eventually reporting to each other the condition of things with regard to fish for mutual assistance in a strong characteristic in the japanese when trouble overcomes them at the appointed time two days before the festival the fishermen started from nano there were thirteen boats they visited first the new island which proved to be simply a large rock there were many rock fish such as rassi and sea perch about it but beyond that there was nothing remarkable it had not had time to gather many sea fish on its surface and there was but little edible seaweed as yet so the thirteen boats went farther to sea to discover what had occurred to their old and excellent thai grounds these were found to produce just about what they used to produce in the days before the earthquake but the fishermen were not able to stay long enough to make a thorough test they had meant to be away all night but at dusk the sky gave every appearance of a storm so they pulled up their anchors and made for home as they came close to the new island they were surprised to see on one side of it the water for the space of two hundred and forty feet square lit up with a strange light the light seemed to come from the bottom of the sea and in spite of the darkness the water was transparent the fishermen very much astonished stopped to gaze down into the blue waters they could see fish swimming about in thousands but the depth was too great for them to see the bottom and so they gave rein to all kinds of superstitious ideas as to the cause of the light and talked from one boat to the other about it a few minutes afterwards they had shipped their immense paddling oars and all was quiet then they heard rumbling noises at the bottom of the sea and this filled them with concertation they feared another eruption the oars were put out again and to say that they went fast would in no way convey an idea of the pace that the men made their boats travel over the two miles between the mainland and the island their homes were reached well before the storm came on but the storm lasted for fully two days and the fishermen were unable to leave the shore as the sea calmed down and the villagers were looking out on the third day cause for astonishment came shooting out of the sea near the island rock were rays that seemed to come from a sun in the bottom of the sea all the village congregated on the beach to see this extraordinary spectacle which was discussed far into the night not even the old priests could throw any light on the subject consequently the fishermen became more and more scared 
and a few of them were ready to venture to sea next day though it was the time for the magnificent sawara king mackerel only one boat left the shore and that belonged to master kansuke a fisherman of some fifty years of age who with his son matakichi a youth of eighteen and a most faithful son was always to the force when anything out of the common had to be done kanasuke had been the acknowledged bold fisherman of nano the leader in all things since most could remember and his faithful and devoted son had followed him from the age of twelve through many perils so that no one was astonished to see their boat leave alone they went first to the tie grounds and fished there during the night catching some thirty odd tie between them the average weight of which would be four pounds towards break of day another storm showed on the horizon kansuke pulled up his anchor and started for home hoping to take in a hobo line which he had dropped overboard near the rocky island on his way out a line holding some two hundred hooks they had reached the island and hauled in nearly the whole line when the rising sea caused kansuke to lose his balance and fall overboard usually the old man would soon have found it an easy matter to scramble back into the boat on this occasion however his head did not appear above water and so his son jumped in to rescue his father he dived into water which almost dazzled him for bright rays were shooting through it he could see nothing of his father but felt that he could not leave him as the mysterious rays rising from the bottom might have something to do with the accident he made up his mind to follow them they must he thought be reflections from the eye of some monster it was a deep dive and for many minutes matakichi was under water at last he reached the bottom and here he found an enormous colony of the awabi ear shells the space covered by them was fully two hundred square feet and in the middle of all was one of gigantic size the like of which he had never heard of from the holes at the top through which the feelers pass shot the bright rays which illuminated the sea rays which are said by the japanese divers to show the presence of a pearl the pearl in this shell thought matakichi the pearl in this shell thought matakichi must be one of enormous size as large as a baby's head from all the awabi shells on the patch he could see the lights that lights were coming which denoted that they contained pearls but wherever he looked matakichi could see nothing of his father he thought his father must have been drowned and if so that the best thing for him to do would be to regain the surface and repair to the village to report his father's death and also his wonderful discovery which would be of such value to the people of nano having after much difficulty reached the surface he to his dismay found the boat broken by the sea which was now high matakichi was lucky however he saw a bit of floating wreckage which he seized and as sea wind and current helped him strong swimmer as he was it was not more than half an hour before he was ashore 
relating to the villagers the adventures of the day his discoveries and the loss of his dear father the fishermen could hardly credit the news that what they had taken to be supernatural lights were caused by ear shells for the much valued ear shell was extremely rare about their district but matakichi was a youth of such trustworthiness that even the most skeptical believed him in the end and had it not been for the loss of kansuki there would have been great rejoicing in the village that evening having told the villagers the news matakichi repaired to the old priest's house at the end of the village and told him also and now that my beloved father is dead said he i myself beg that you will make me one of your disciples so that i may pray daily for my father's spirit the old priest followed matakichi's wish and said not only shall i be glad to have so brave and filial a youth as yourself as a disciple but also i myself would pray with you for your father's spirit and on the twenty-first day from his death we will take boats and pray over the spot at which he was drowned accordingly on the morning of the twenty-first day after the drowning of poor kansuki his son and the priest were anchored over the place where he had been lost and prayers for the spirit of the dead were said that same night the priest awoke at midnight he felt ill at ease and thought much of the spiritual affairs of his flock suddenly he saw an old man standing near the head of his couch who bowed courteously and said i am the spirit of the great earshell lying on the bottom of the sea near rocky island my age is over one thousand years some days ago a fisherman fell from his boat into the sea and i killed and ate him this morning i heard your reverence praying over the place where i lay with the son of the man i ate your sacred prayers have taught me shame and i sorrow for the thing i have done by way of atonement i have ordered my followers to scatter themselves while i have determined to kill myself so that the pearls that are in my shell may be given to matakichi the son of the man i ate all i ask is that you should pray for my spirit's welfare farewell saying which the ghost of the ear shell vanished early next morning when matakichi opened his shutters to dust the front of his door he found thereat what he took at first to be a large rock covered with seaweed and even with pink coral on closer examination matakichi found it to be the immense ear shell which he had seen at the bottom of the sea off rocky island he rushed off to the temple to tell the priest who told matakichi of his visitation during the night the shell and the body contained therein were carried to the temple with every respect and much ceremony prayers were said over it and though the shell and the immense pearl were kept in the temple the body was buried in a tomb next to kansuki's with a monument erected over it and another over kansuki's grave Madachichi changed his name to that of nichigi and lived happily there have been no ear shells seen near nano since but on the rocky island is erected a shrine to the spirit of the ear shell note 
a three thousand yen pearl which i know of was sold for twelve cents by a fisherman from the west it came from a temple belongs now to mikomotu and is this size end of chapter forty three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter forty four of ancient tales and folklore of japan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org ancient tales and folklore of japan by richard gordon smith human fireflies in funakami mura omi province lived an old farmer called kanshiro the like of him for honesty charity and piety had never been known no not even among the priesthood annually kanshiro made pilgrimages to various parts of the country to say his prayers and do his duty towards the various deities never thinking of his old age or of his infirmities he was not strong and suffered almost always from dysentery during the hot weather consequently he usually made his pilgrimages in cooler times in the eighth year of kwansei however kanshiro felt that he could not live another year and feeling that he should not like to miss making another pilgrimage to the great shrines at ise he resolved to take all risks and go in august the hottest month the people in funakami village subscribed one hundred yen for the venerable man so that he might have the honour and credit of presenting a decent sum to the great shrines on a certain day therefore kanshiro started alone with the money hung in a bag about his neck he had walked from sunrise to sunset for two days when on the third in great heat he arrived at the village of myojo feeling nearly dead with weakness for he had another attack of his old complaint kanshiro felt that he could not continue his journey while this lasted especially as he considered himself in an unclean condition unfit to carry the holy money which had been entrusted to him by his friends in funakami he went accordingly to the cheapest inn he could find and confided both his story and the hundred yen to the landlord saying sir i am an old man sick with dysentery if you will take care of me for a day or two i shall be better keep also until i am well this sacred money for it would not do for me to defile it by carrying it with me while i am unwell Timpachi, the innkeeper bowed and gave every assurance that kanshiro's wish should be followed fear nothing said he i will place the money in its bag in a safe place and myself attend upon you until you are well for such good men as you are rare for five days the poor old man was very sick indeed but with his indomitable pluck he recovered and on the sixth day decided to start again it was a fine day kanshiro paid his bill thanked the landlord for his kindness and was handed over his money-bag at the door he did not look into the bag because there were many coolies and pilgrims about he did not wish these strangers to see that he carried much money instead of hanging it about his neck as he had done before he put the bag into his sack of clothing and food and started off towards midday kanshiro stopped to rest and eat his cold rice under a pine tree on examining his bag he found the hundred yen gone and stones of the same weight placed in it instead the poor man was greatly disconcerted he did not even wait to eat his rice but started back to the inn which he reached at dusk he explained as best he could the facts to jimpachi the innkeeper at first this worthy listened to the story with some sympathy but when kanshido begged him to return the money he flew into a rage you old rascal said he 
a nice story you're telling to try and blackmail me i'll give you a lesson that you'll not forget and with that he struck the old man a severe blow on the chest and then seizing a stick beat him unmercifully the coolies joined in and thrashed him until he was nearly dead poor old fellow what could he do alone as he was he crawled away half dead but he got to the sacred ise shrines three days later and after saying his prayers started back to funakami here he arrived seriously ill on telling his story some believed him but others did not so overcome with grief was he he sold his small property to refund the money and with the rest he continued his pilgrimages to various temples and shrines at last all his money was gone but even then he continued his pilgrimages begging food as he went three years later he again visited myojo village on his way to ise and here he learned that his enemy had since made a good deal of money and now lived in quite a good house kanshido went and found him and said three years ago you stole the money entrusted to me i sold my property to refund the people what they'd given me to take to ise i have been a beggar and a wanderer ever since think not that i shall not be avenged i shall be you are young i am old vengeance will overtake you soon jimpachi still protested innocence and began to get angry saying you disreputable old blackguard if you want a meal of rice say so but do not dare to threaten me at this moment the watchman on his rounds took kanshido for a real beggar and seizing him by the arm dragged him to the end of the village and ordered him not to re-enter it on pain of arrest and there the poor old man died of anger and weakness the good priest of the neighbouring temple took the body and buried it with respect saying prayers jimpachi in the meantime afflicted with a guilty conscience became sick until after a few days he was unable to leave his bed after he had lost all power of movement a curious thing occurred thousands and thousands of fireflies came out of kanshido's tomb and flew to the bedroom of jimpachi they surrounded his mosquito curtain and tried to force their way in the top of the curtain was pressed down with them the air was foul with them the glimmer dazzled the sick man's eyes no rest was possible the villagers came in to try and kill them but they could make no impression for the string of flies from kanshido's tomb continued as fast as others were killed the fireflies went nowhere else than to jimpachi's room and there they only surrounded his bed one or two villagers seeing this said it must be true that jimpachi stole the money from the old man and that this is his spirit's revenge then everyone feared to kill the flies thicker and thicker they grew until they did at last make a hole in the mosquito net and then they settled all over jimpachi they got in his mouth his nose his ears and his eyes he kicked and screamed and lived thus in agony for twenty days and after his death the flies disappeared completely end of chapter forty four recording by rob marland chapter forty five of ancient tales and folklore of japan this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith The Chrysanthemum Hermit Many years ago there lived at the foot of the mountains of Nambu, in Adachigan, Saitama Prefecture, an old man named Kikuo, which means Chrysanthemum Old Man. Kikuo was a faithful retainer of Tsugaru. He was then called Sawada Hayato. Kikuo was a man of great bodily strength and fine appearance, and had much to do with the efficiency of the small fighting force 
which protected the feudal lord, the castle, and the estates. Nevertheless, an evil day came. The feudal lord's small force was overthrown, the estates and castle were lost. The lord and his faithful retainer, with the few survivors, escaped to the mountains where they continued to think that a day might come when they would be able to have their revenge. During the enforced idleness, Kikuo, knowing his lord's love of flowers, especially of the chrysanthemum, made his mind up to devote all his spare time to making chrysanthemum beds. This, he thought, would lessen the pain of defeat and exile. The feudal lord was greatly pleased, but his cares and anxieties were not abated. He sickened and died in great poverty, much to the sorrow of Kikuo and the rest of his followers. Kikuo wept night and day, over the humble and lonely grave. But he busied himself again to please the spirit of his lord by planting chrysanthemums round the tomb and tending them daily. By and by the border of the flowers was thirty yards broad, to the wonder of all who saw. It was because of that Hayato got the name of Chrysanthemum Old Man. The chrysanthemum is in China a holy flower. Ancient history tells of a man called Hoso, great-grandson of the Emperor Juikai, who lived to the age of 800 years without showing the slightest sign of decay. This was attributed to his drinking the dew of the chrysanthemum. Besides his devotion to flowers, Kikuo delighted in children. From the village he called them to his poor hut, and as there was no schoolmaster he taught them to write, to read, and jujitsu. The children loved him, and the good villagers revered him as if he were a kind of a god. In about his eighty-second year, Kikuo caught cold, and the fever which came with it gave him great pain. During the daytime, his pupils attended to his wants, but at night the old man was alone in his cottage. One autumn night he awoke and found standing about his veranda some beautiful children. They did not look quite like any children he knew. They were too beautiful and noble-looking to be the poor of the village. Kiko Osama, cried two of them, do not fear us, though we are not real children. We are the spirits of the chrysanthemum which you love so much, and of which you have taken such care. We have come to tell you how sorry we are to see you ill although we have heard that in China there once lived a man called Hoso who lived for eight hundred years by drinking the dew which falls from the flowers. We have tried all we can to prolong your life, but we find that the heavens do not allow that you should live to a much greater age than you have already reached. In thirty days more you will die. Make ready, therefore, to depart. Saying this, they all wept bitterly. Goodbye, then said Kikuo. I have no further hopes of living. Let my death be easy. In the next world I may be able to serve my old lord and master. The only thing that makes me sad to leave this world is you. I must forever regret to leave my chrysanthemums. Saying this, he smiled at them in affection. You have been very kind to us, said the Kiku spirits, and we love you for it. Man rejoices at birth and feels sad at death, yet now you shed no tears. You say you do not mind dying except for leaving us. If you die, we shall not survive, for it would be useless misery. Believe us when we say that we shall die with you. As the spirits of the chrysanthemums finished speaking, a puff of wind came about the house and they disappeared. As the day dawned, the old man grew worse and strange to say all the chrysanthemums began to fade even those which were just beginning to bloom the leaves crumbled up and dried as the spirits had foretold at the end of the thirtieth day the old man died the kiku flowers died then not one was left in the whole district the villagers could not account for it they buried the old man near his lord and thinking to honor and please him planted, time after time, chrysanthemums near his grave. 
but all faded and died as soon as they were planted the two little graves were at last given up and they remain in their solitude with wild grasses only growing about them end of chapter forty five Chapter 46 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith the princess peony many years ago at gamugan in the province of omi was a castle called adzuchi no shiro it was a magnificent old place surrounded by walls and a moat filled with lotus lilies the feudal lord was a very brave and wealthy man yuki Nizen no jo his wife had been dead for some years he had no son but he had a beautiful daughter aged eighteen who for some reason which is not quite clear to me was given the title of princess for a considerable period there had been peace and quiet in the land the feudal lords were on the best of terms and every one was happy amid these circumstances lord nizen no jo perceived that there was a good opportunity to find a husband for his daughter princess aya and after a time the second son of the lord of ako of harima province was selected to the satisfaction of both fathers the affair having little to do with the principles lord ako's son had viewed his bride with approval and she him one may say that young people are bound to approve each other when it is the parents wish that they be united many suicides result from this princess aya made her mind up to try and love her prospective husband she saw nothing of him but she thought of him and talked of him one evening when princess aya was walking in the magnificent gardens by the moonlight accompanied by her maids in waiting she wandered down through her favorite peony bed to the pond where she loved to gaze at her reflection on the nights of the full moon to listen to frogs and to watch the fireflies when nearing the pond her foot slipped and she would have fallen into the water had it not been that a young man appeared as if by magic and caught her he disappeared as soon as he put her on her feet again the maids of honor saw her slip they saw a glimmer of light and that was all but princess aya had seen more she had seen the handsomest young man she could imagine twenty-one years old she said to o sado san her favorite maid he must have been a samurai of the highest order his dress was covered with my favorite peonies and his swords were richly mounted oh that i could have seen him a minute longer to thank him for saving me from the water who can he be and how could he have got into our garden through all the guards so spoke the princess to her maids directing them at the same time that they were to say a word to no one for fear that her father should hear find the young man and behead him for trespass after this evening princess aya fell sick she could not eat or sleep and turned pale 
the day for her marriage with the young lord of aku came and went without the event she was far too sick for that the best of the doctors had been sent from kyoto which was then the capital but none of them had been able to do anything and the maid grew thinner and thinner as a last resort the lord nizen no jo her father sent for her most confidential maid and friend o sadayo and demanded if she could give any reason for his daughter's mysterious sickness had she a secret lover had she a particular dislike for her betrothed sir said o sadayo i do not like to tell secrets but here it seems my duty to your lordship's daughter as well as to your lordship some three weeks ago when the moon was at its full we were walking in the peony beds down near the pond where the princess loves to be she stumbled and nearly fell into the water when a strange thing happened in an instant a most beautiful young samurai appeared and held her up thus preventing her from falling into the pond we could all see the glimmer of him but your daughter and i saw him most distinctly before your daughter could thank him he had disappeared none of us could understand how it was possible for a man to get into the gardens of the princess for the gates of the castle are guarded on all sides and the princess's garden is so much better guarded than the rest that it seems truly incredible that a man could get in we maids were asked to say nothing for fear of your lordship's anger since that evening it is that our beloved princess aya has been sick sir it is sickness of the heart she is deeply in love with the young samurai she saw for so brief a space indeed my lord there never was such a handsome man in the world before and if we cannot find him the young princess i fear will die how is it possible for a man to get into the grounds said lord yuki nazan no jo people say foxes and badgers assume the figures of men sometimes but even so it is possible for such supernatural beings to enter my castle grounds guarded as it is at every opening that evening the poor princess was more wearily unhappy than ever before thinking to enliven her a little the maid sent for a celebrated player on the biwa called yashika kenjo the weather being hot they were sitting on the gallery and gawa and while the musician was playing danarora there appeared suddenly from behind the peonies the same handsome young samurai he was visible to all this time even to the peonies embroidered on his dress there he is there he is they cried at which he instantly disappeared again the princess was highly excited and seemed more lively than she had been for days the old daimo grew more puzzled than ever when he heard of it next night while two of the maids were playing for their mistress o ye san the flute and o yakumo the koto the figure of the young man appeared again a thorough search having been made during the day in the immense peony beds was absolutely no result not even the sign of a footmark the thing was increasingly strange a consultation was held and it was decided by the lord of the castle to invite a veteran officer of great strength and renown maki higo to capture the youth should he appear that evening 
makihigo readily consented and at the appointed time dressed in black and consequently invisible concealed himself among the peonies music seemed to have a fascination for the young samurai it was while music was being played that he made his appearances consequently oye and yukumo resumed their concert while all gazed eagerly towards the peony beds as the ladies played a piece called sofurin there sure enough arose the figure of a young samurai dressed magnificently in clothes which were covered with embroidered peonies every one gazed at him and wondered why maki hugo did not jump up and catch him the fact was that maki hugo was so much astonished by the noble bearing of the youth that at first he did not like to touch him recovering himself and thinking of his duty to his lord he stealthily approached the young man and seizing him round the waist held him tight after a few seconds maki hiogo felt a kind of wet steam falling on his face by degrees it made him faint and he fell to the ground still grasping the young samurai for he had made up his mind that he would secure him every one had seen the scuffle and some of the guards came hurrying to the place just as they reached the spot maki hugo came to his senses and shouted come gentlemen i have caught him come and see but on looking at what he held in his arms he discovered it to be only a large peony by this time the lord nasin no jo had arrived at the spot where maki hugo lay and so had the princess Ewa and her maids all were astonished and mystified except the daimo himself who said ah it is as i said no fox or badger spirit could pass our guards and get into this garden it is the spirit of the peony flower that took the form of a prince turning to his daughter and her maids he said you must take this as a compliment and pay great respect to the peony and show the one caught by maki hugo kindness as well by taking care of it the princess Aya carried the flower back to her room where she put it in a vase of water and placed it near her pillow she felt as if she had her sweetheart with her day by day she got better she tended the peony herself and strange to say the flower seemed to get stronger and stronger instead of fading at last the princess recovered she became radiantly beautiful while the peony continued to remain in perfect bloom showing no sign of dying the princess Aya being now perfectly well her father could no longer put off the wedding consequently some days later the lord of ako and his family arrived at the castle and his second son was married to the princess as soon as the wedding was over the peony was found still in its vase but dead and withered the villagers always after this instead of speaking of the princess Aya or Aya Himi, called her botan Himi or peony princess end of chapter forty six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c hello so that was interesting kind of violent today though but anyway that's that's the way the fairy tales are like it's amazing how um 
violent they are. Um, so we've got another 11 stories left. Yeah, they're pretty awesome, especially when you hear the whole story instead of the watered-down pretty stories that you get from Disney. Like, I love Disney, but they definitely water down the fairy tales. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking, I don't, I don't know if thir Thursday, Tuesday, Tuesday night, if I'm going to just play the whole thing, the rest of it or not. I guess we'll see how it goes. Maybe we'll just finish it off and uh, find something else to listen to. Um, cause this is a whole swack of fairy tales. Like a lot. Um, there's 57 stories in here uh, of Japanese fairy tales, so that's like quite a bit. So anyway, um, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. And sorry for the little bit of a late start. It was all kinds of fun. Um, so you like the, uh, my blankie. I'm getting it done. I've got my curtain done. I'm still working on the blanket. Seems like I'm gonna need it sooner, though. It's, um, uh, it's quite a bit, uh, um, spit it out, Nadine. It's quite a bit cooler the last few days at night. Um, the, uh, Last night, it, I think it got down to around 4 or 5 degrees Celsius, which is only like 30, what's freezing, 32 Fahrenheit? Four, 4 Celsius to Fahrenheit. Yeah, 39 Fahrenheit is what it was last night about. Somewhere around there. Apparently in some parts of Newfoundland it got down to minus, uh, minus um, 1.6 or so, so that's like 30 degrees Fahrenheit, something like that. So, uh, excuse me, jeez, that's what it is. Not even close. Well, sort of for here. Like, we, we've got mild temperatures. We, we go to about minus five for most of the winter, which is, um, like, like I'm still wearing a light jacket most of the winter. Minus five Celsius is 23. So it's, it's around 20 Fahrenheit most of the winter here. And, uh, we get cold snaps. It'll be around, um, minus uh, 15. That's about 5 Fahrenheit. So, that's minus 5 Fahrenheit, or 5 Fahrenheit are cold snaps. But it's around, uh, 15 Fahrenheit, or... Minus five, uh, 23 Fahrenheit, yeah. Most of the winter here. Freezes at 50? Oh my gosh, you'd be cold here already. <laughs> it's, it's been nice here with it, with it around 50. I like it. I'm, I'm, I like that a lot better. Then the whole bell thing, thing, excuse me, I don't think I got enough sleep last night. <laughs> I've been really tired. <laughs> but oh well, what do you do? Um, so thanks for joining me, I really appreciate it. Uh, like, subscribe, share, all that kind of fun stuff. And, and uh, if you want to support, uh, that's contagious. Uh, yeah, I know. Um, I've spread it across the world via the internet. <laughs> um, 
So if you, you like my work, consider supporting me on my Patreon and uh, PayPal. And uh, all the links are down below. Um, and we'll see you again for the live on Tuesday. Tuesday night, 8 o'clock, 6 central. So have a wonderful day, guys. Love you. Bye. Where's the button?